You're listening to Spotlight, the podcast that fosters connections with veterans and military spouses. Here's your host, Bob Lowden. Welcome, everybody. This is the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. This is your host, Bob Lauvin. Very pleased to welcome Dennis Volpe today as my guest on the Spotlight. Uh, He is the author of a book called Transition on Purpose, a U.S. Naval Academy grad, currently executive performance and transition coach with Leadership Research Institute. Uh, Dennis, welcome to the program. Thank you for being my guest today. Absolutely, Bob. Super excited uh, to be connected with you and uh, have the opportunity to uh, be in the spotlight and in the arena with you. Uh, so you, you know, you've got that that uh, quote in your book. I'm wondering if you can say it all uh, well, from memory. But uh, no. hey, you know, uh, Dennis, Dennis and I met through uh, a group called Ring Knockers. We'll put a shout out out there for that organization. Uh, I'm kind of running through the Ring Knockers Rolodex here. I think you're the third uh, Ring Knockers connection that I've had on the program. Very pleased to have you. I'll, I'll share a little story as kind of a segue here. Um, Gosh, probably uh, 1994, uh, I had a transition situation. Uh, You know, at the time it was very embarrassing, but, uh, you know, I look back on it and it was a very transformational thing to get fired uh, in 1994 uh, and actually opened my eyes and made me focus upon where I was headed with renewed vigor and actually for the first time in my life really had some purpose in my transition. You've written the book Transition on Purpose, but let's talk about your personal story first. Sure. Um, I like to say, uh, you know, as, as a coach, uh, why, why, why should you talk to me? And uh, it's because I know what success looks like. I know what success feels like. I, and I know what's required to be successful. Uh, you know, having gone to the Naval Academy and having a very successful uh, military career and being selected for command. I mean, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty, pretty good group of people to be associated with. And, um, but I also know what it feels like to fail and um, what's required not to be a failure. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like being on top of the world uh, from, from a pers- professional perspective. You know, you're, you're a ship captain, you're a commanding officer, and you're providing maritime security uh, ops to the Sochi Winter Olympics. You know, you're close enough to the, to the Sochi coast that you can actually see the Olympic torch in, in the foreground of, of the Sochi mountains. And then um, you know, everything that you're doing is being briefed to the highest levels of the military and civilian chain of command. So, like I said, from a professional perspective, it's awesome stuff. And uh, then you have to check check off station to go get uh, gas and groceries, we like to say. Uh, And we sailed across the Black Sea and uh, entered Samson Harbor, Samson, Turkey. And we had a mishap, we had a grounding, we damaged the propeller and we were deemed non-mission capable. So in the matter of about 24 hours, I went from being on top of the world to being in the lowest valley personally and professionally, or at least so I thought. And uh, and then, I mean, that started basically a 24 month journey to figure out who I was, what mattered to me and what I wanted to do about it. Uh, Just based on the military judicial system and retirement system and, and everything associated with that. So, you know, why did I write that book? I think for three reasons. One, uh, because I had a lot of mentors tell me I should. Um, so I, I got tired of being shit on, I like to say. Uh-huh, uh, okay. So it's, it's a personal story, but it's not a unique story like you started out with. Everybody transitions. Right. It's just how we transition that matters. And, and finally, you know, as, as an executive performance coach over the past almost five years, I've just seen trends that exist and I wanted to, to be helpful to others. And when you take those trends, whether it's about 
self-awareness, or it's about confusing change and transition, or confusing resilience and perseverance, or not realizing that life is a team sport, you need to ask for help, or you need to think about yourself and what matters to you. So that way you can have a plan that makes sense. That's why the book happened. And, and that's kind of my story, Bob. How, you know, I've had a number of authors on, on the program and, um, uh, you think you're going to write another book? Uh, is, is there another one in the works? I'm, how does one discover, how does one make the decision to write a book? I mean, was this sort of a, uh, a cathartic, uh, uh, type of, uh, of thing? It absolutely was. Um, and I didn't think it was going to be, but, but it was, um, and, you know, part of my transition involves some, some stuff that I never thought I would do. And, and what do I mean by that? You know, I never thought I would write a book, but I also never thought I would write a song. About- I saw that. You, you, you were involved with Southern Ground. Did, did, uh, that uh, Zach Brown uh, is affiliated with that. Well, and I saw the Zach lyrics in your book, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's Zach Brown's camp. I mean, did you get to meet uh, Zach Brown when you were down there? No, no. Um, and, and that's kind of his, that's kind of what he does. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is he doesn't want to make the camp about him. Right. He, want to make, he wants to make the camp about the participants, whether it's the summer camp that happens in June, July, and August, or the camps for military veterans, whether it's the Warrior Week program or the Warrior Path program. He doesn't want to make the camp about him. He wants to wants to make it about the participants. I, I had a, um, a guy named Brent Gleason on a few weeks ago, and Brent has written a book called "Embrace the Suck." You you and your book actually write that you don't have to always be embracing the suck. Can we can we talk about the uh, uh, the difference there? And and uh, uh, well, in your I, I listened I listened to uh, you you and Brett talk about it, and uh, you know it made me chuckle because um, I had a feeling you were going to ask me about that. I'm definitely going to ask you. <laughs> and you know because when you think about embracing the suck. You know, why do we always have to make things difficult? Why can't we spend the time to figure out what matters, what's important, and focusing our energy, our attention, and our effort on that and doing things in the most effective and efficient way possible instead of embracing the suck? Be more resilient and lean into that adversity but do it so that way it's not as painful as it needs to be. I think, I think, you know, embracing the suck in the, in the context of maybe the broader discussion here is, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable, but you know, that leads to growth and change. Right. I I can assure you that I was, uh, I'm not sure I was embracing leading up to my firing, but I was definitely experiencing the suck, uh, you know, and, um, you know, it's just one of those things. I mean, it, it opened my eyes. I used a book called What Color Is Your Parachute at that point in time and went through a pretty significant self-study. And that's when I became interested in and pursued a career in finance. I had been in manufacturing and operations and, um, you know, I tell this story, I mean, mine had a happy ending. Um, you know, I secured uh, uh, a real career change. And I tell this story, not to brag, but because, you know, if you can find the right fit, it, it lends to your success. My bonus, 16 months into the new job, was three times the salary I was making where I got fired. Right. And, and, and it was clearly because I was enjoying what I was doing. And if you enjoy what you're doing and find your niche, you can be really good at it. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that's why I, I like to say you need to pursue your purpose. And when I, when I say that, uh, and I think I, I think that I got tied into that when 
I went through um, the Commit Foundation's online program. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I started exploring it a little bit more. And there seemed to be a confusion between passion and purpose. And, you know, I think with passion, there's stray voltage. But with purpose, it's, it's passion with boundaries that really looks at, well, what are our strengths? What are we really good at? And you know what? What gives us energy? And then what are the problems that we want to solve? And you talked about going from what you were doing in the manufacturing space to, you know, the financial space. And I'm sure that that leveraged your strengths a little bit better. You were a little bit more passionate about it. And you know what? It allowed you to really dive into the things that matter to you. Did you, uh, so let's talk a little bit about your specific transition because during that two year period, you were going through sort of the bureaucratic administrative part of it, but you were also actively participating in some coaching things. Uh, uh, we'll come back to the triathlon uh, uh, part of it, but talk a little bit about some of the real in-depth uh, self-study work that you did during your transition. Sure. Um, well, I think it really starts with, I didn't know what coaching was uh, when I was told to get into it. Uh, so Somebody said you need to you need to get into executive coaching, and uh, I thought was, it was that great. was that the result of some you know Myers Briggs study or uh, analysis like that, or was it just a feel? It was a feel from it was a, a mentor that told you yeah. that. Okay, yep. they said you know I've been around you, I've been associated with you for a long time, and I see what you do and I see how you do it. Uh, you need to coach other people. And I said, well, I did that as a rugby coach. Uh, when I was at the Naval Academy, uh, when I was a leadership instructor. So I, I get this coaching thing. And of course, they had to sit me down and say, no, that's not really what we're talking about. They said, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to get certified. I'm going to get qualified. You know, I'm a, I'm a military officer. So if I'm going to do something, in, in, at least in my opinion, I'm going to do it right. So I went through the Columbia Executive Coaching Program, which was a 10 to 12 month program that had both an academic portion to it, as well as a practicum portion. So it provided you with the basis of human performance and it, it allowed you to practice. And uh, I knew that coaching was a whole person kind of thing. So I wanted to make sure that I really understood how people think, how people feel, how people act. So I got certified in emotional intelligence. I got certified in the, in the kneading brain instrument. I got certified in the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, and I also went through the Gallup Strengths Coaching Certification Program, as well as the ProSide Change Management uh, Program. So it, it provides me the opportunity to provide some informed insight and some different perspective for my coaching clients to consider uh, if they want to change, well, you need to think differently, you need to behave differently, and you need to do differently. But we also need to know where we're starting from. You uh, you engaged in a couple of things, and I apologize for jumping around, uh, uh, but uh, I'll come back to the triathlon thing in, in just a moment. One of the things that, uh, or a couple of things you talked about, you know, the importance of mentorship, and you also, uh, I guess you had a couple of groups that were virtual uh, group. She had a masterminds group and you had a mentor group. And then you, and you sort of talk about the, you know, sort of an inner circle. And then you talk about a broader circle. Uh, but, but uh, that, and, I, and if I'm mixing these things up, I apologize, you know, as an engineer reading literature, reading your thing. So, uh, but, you know, you talk about an individual, you know, quick reaction force, right? Absolutely. Uh, that, that's a really interesting concept. I was sitting there thinking about, you know, gosh, who would be on my QRF team? You know, talk about that. Yeah, uh, I, I think about the people that are on my QRF and, and why, you know, for, for the non-military folks, you know, a quick reaction force uh, is, is a force, normally an armed force that provides assistance and support when things go sideways. Uh, when you think about it from, from a Navy perspective, and you know, I was a, 
I was a surface warfare officer. So on ships, we actually have two types of QRFs, one for damage control, firefighting, flooding, and all that stuff, and then one for anti-terrorism. Mm -hmm. So, but what about for life? Well, sometimes you need insight, sometimes you need perspective, sometimes you need support, and sometimes you need accountability. So who are those people that regardless of the time of day, regardless of the issue, you can call them on the phone and say, hey, Bob, you know what? I got this going on uh, and I could really use your perspective. And, and, you know, I've got, or, I've, I immediately thought of three individuals in my life that, you know, no matter what I had done, no matter how bad I had screwed up, you know, they weren't going to be judgmental. They were going to have my back. Yeah. And it's so important to have that. And, but it also requires openness and, and vulnerability. Right. Like to say, Bob, you know what? I've got this going on and I don't have the answer and I need your help. And, you know, that takes openness. It takes vulnerability. And, you know, I was a history major at the Naval Academy and, uh, and I'm also a Navy guy. So I like to say, if, if you don't want to be open and vulnerable, well, what you're telling me is you're okay getting eaten by sharks. And what do I mean by that? The USS Indianapolis, you know that story? Uh, a little bit, but I bet you've got some insights on it. Yeah, so they got sunk by a Japanese submarine after delivering the components of the atomic bomb on their way back to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of that crew perished and got eaten by sharks. And one of the things that came out of that was the Navy's movement reporting system, where when you're out at sea every four hours, you basically tell the Navy, this is where I'm at, this is where I'm going, and this is how I'm doing. And in life, if you don't want to be open with the people who matter and the people who can support you and let them know where you're at, where you're going and how you're doing, you're telling me you're, you're okay getting eaten by sharks. Didn't we have, wasn't there a story a few years ago where a commander in the Pacific mis, misreported his position and uh, we got in serious trouble for that. Mm -hmm. I think I recall something like that. And not being a swabby, though, I, I uh, you know, don't necessarily follow all those stories. Yeah. You, um, you've got nine, you have this wheel in your book. Yep. And it's nine secrets uh, that get us there. Um, you know, define your objectives. The second one, I think, is know your values. How do you build that, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, you went through some examination, you know, that was a very uh, hard look at yourself, right? And understanding your values. What can you share with our listeners about that concept in your book? Yeah, well, well, that whole concept uh, is based on the Columbia coaching methodology that really looks at human performance and uh, three basic questions around what's up, what matters and what's next. Mm -hmm. And when we, and we look at that, the first three and uh, particularly the values piece is, well, what's up, you know, where do you want to go? What matters to you and where are you at? And from a values perspective, you know, for me, um, you know, I was 18 years old, went to the Naval Academy and the, the military told me what my values were. It was easy. Was, was the decision to go to a military, to, to go to the academy, was that something you made as a senior in high school or was it a dream that you had for a long time leading up to that? It was not a, a long dream. Um, to, to be completely frank, I, I actually thought I was going to West Point. I, I was a recruited lacrosse player uh, and um, planned on going to West Point. And I would say one of the big reasons I didn't go to West Point, and for those that have gone to, uh, you know, West Point or have visited there or whatever, I visited West Point in January. 
so I was like, wow. And, and we, we used to, we used to call that period of time, the dark ages. Uh, yes. it, it's, uh, it's a little gloomy, uh, at VMI in the middle of January too. Well, guess what? It's also gloomy at the Naval Academy in January, right. but I went and visited the Naval Academy in April. There you go. Everybody's walking around in their crisp white uniforms and the weather's yeah, beautiful. All the, all the flowers are blooming. That's right. Sunny and everything else. So that was really one of the big reasons I ended up going to the Naval Academy uh, was really just because of the time of year. Um, but it, it, I knew that I was going to do something associated with the military because my family uh, has a history of military service. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know if it was pre-World War II, uh, but you know, both my grandfathers were in World War II. I had a great uncle who was in World War II. So, you know, Pearl Harbor, Guadalcanal, the European theater, <laughs> uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Vietnam, you know, there's, so service to country was something that I grew up with. Um, right. So it was important to me. So I was either going into the military as, as an enlisted sailor or Marine, or I ended up going to, and I was actually in a delayed entry program for the Marine Corps when I got accepted to the Naval Academy. And, you know, the recruiter said, hey, you're going there. I said, all right. Yeah, you know, this is, this is a, uh, I'm going to tee this one up for you nicely because you talk about in the book about, you know, this, these were definitely not transitions on purpose, right? No. Talk a little bit about that. No. Um, I like to say, uh, you know, my, my decision to go to the Naval Academy, obviously we just talked about, I probably didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. Um, I put some thought into it uh, and then I really thought that you know, anybody that go. becomes a plebe or a rat or a knob or whatever it is, uh, you know, realizes within about an hour that it was an uninformed decision. Usually, yes. <laughs> and, um, and then when it was time to, you know, fast forward, you know, eight, nine years. And I always knew that I wanted to do military service so I can get that you know, leadership experience, that small unit leadership experience. So that way I could do other stuff. Uh, but that was in 2000, early 2001, when it was time to decide, do I stay or do I go? And at the time, the only thing I thought about was federal law enforcement. But at that time, pre-September 11th, 2001, there wasn't a whole lot of hiring going on. So the one thing I thought about a little bit wasn't available, but the, the Navy provided me an excellent opportunity. They said, hey, you know what? You're at the Naval Academy right now teaching leadership. What if we send you to grad school and extend you for an extra year doing that stuff and give you a bonus? I'm like, that sounds great. And then, so I signed up, you know, the only, you know, big effort I did was signing some paperwork. Um, so that was, you know, an accidental transition. And then every other time I had to decide, do I stay or do I go? And my decision criteria was, am I still having fun? I don't know if that's a really good, you know, decision matrix, um, but then the Navy said, well, you know what? We'll give you a bonus. So that makes, I, am I having The low hanging fruit was pretty appealing, wasn't it? Yeah. Let me, let me ask a, a question. Maybe this one will catch you flat footed, but um, you know, looking back, you know, uh, is, is there a decision that you made during that period of time that, you know, clearly with the years of maturity and experience you have now that, maybe you would have gotten out of the Navy or, you know, is that something you've ever thought about in the middle of the night and pondered? I, I've thought about it, but, you know, when I, you know, what is it? The um, happenstance theory, right? You know, when we look back on our life, it all makes sense. 
um, that there's absolutely planned and unplanned events that happen that as we're going through life don't necessarily make sense. But when we actually look at it in hindsight, it does make sense. So I'm not, I'm not sure um, because the things that I have in my life now, whether, you know, it's, it's, it's a loving wife, a loving family, uh, all that stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change for the world. Now, uh, uh, in, in your book, you talk about, you know, there really isn't a past and there really isn't a future. You need to be focused on the present. I, I had a dream uh, one time and I, I do a poor job of sharing this, but, you know, I actually got my wish to go back and do some things over but I had the knowledge of, um, you know, everything that I'd learned leading up to that transition yeah. and, and very quickly in the dream realized that, oh my gosh, if I don't do everything exactly the way I did it before, I won't have my three sons and I won't have, you know, these experiences. And, and that's what they, and so in a sense, that gift, that, that dream was a real gift to me. Uh, you know, it gave me the benefit of, of, of perspective of yeah. uh, that sort of thing. Let's let's talk about another uh, piece of the wheel, which is crystallizing your priorities. Uh, how does one, how do you coach people to crystallize their priorities? Well, I, I don't know that I answered your, your question earlier about values. And uh, so we can, I could touch on that a little bit um, because the military gave me my values when I entered the Naval Academy and they were the same values for the next 24 years. And when it was time to make a decision about, well, what do I do next? Honor, courage, and commitment really doesn't help when you're trying to make personal life decisions, or at least it didn't for me. Uh, so figuring out, well, if you took everything that matters, if you took one thing away, what would really impact me? And that's autonomy. After 24 years of military service, if I did not have the autonomy that I wanted and needed, things, things would be difficult. Things would be hard. I would really have to embrace the suck. <laughs> mm. um, and then, well, what matters next? What, do I, what else do I need in my life? Well, I need impact. I need to positively impact my environment, whether, whether that's at home, personally, or the work that I do professionally. And, and then finally is, is security. And when I think about security, it's physical, emotional, and financial safety to do that impactful work and have that autonomy. And uh, one of the things that I've added recently and I think our discussion today is a perfect example of it, is connection. I need connection with positive people, people who make me better, people who challenge me to be a better version of myself, people who challenge me to be better today than I was yesterday. So when I think about the values that I need or the things that I need in my life, it's autonomy, impact, connection, and security. And then in terms of priorities, and, and you, you highlighted it a, a little bit, Bob, in terms of not what you needed before, not what you're going to need in six months or 12 months, what matters right now? What, are you, what is the problem that you're trying to solve for? And what do you need to prioritize in your life to make a decision? And to being really honest, and I have found that that is the key, right? I need to make this amount of money. I need to live in this location. You know, I need to be, you know, on the East Coast because that's where my in-laws are and that's where my family is and they matter to me and I wanna have the ability to not only you know, get there by airplane, but if things went sideways, I'd have the ability to drive there in eight hours. Mm -hmm. Those are priorities. Those are what should, when you couple that with your values, that's what should inform your decision-making. 
You, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump around one more time. You know, sure. One of the hard things that you did during your transition was become a triathlete, so to speak. Uh, you started doing Ironman races and, uh, I think the first one you signed up without having given it much thought, but uh, <laughs> real challenge. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure I could ride a bike casually for a few miles and I'm, and I do run a lot, but like you, I think, uh, you know, uh, swimming a mile and a half or something, that would be the tall pole in the tent for me. Oh, uh, absolutely. So to speak. I, I like to say, and, you know, my hat's off to all of my, you know, special warfare friends that, that swim all the time and they're combat divers and all that. Because when I talk about the struggle that I have in triathloning, everybody's like, well, you're in the Navy for 24 years if you include your academy time. I'm like, yes, I spent time on ships. So if I was swimming, things that had to have gone horribly, horribly wrong. That's right. Um, so... <laughs> But, um, and I like to say, you know, when you, if you start at the end and come back to the beginning and you, you kind of highlighted this a little bit, Bob, you know, if you're running, you can slow down. Matter of fact, you could stop. That's right. And you could even, you could even sit down. Same thing on a bike. But you know what? When you're swimming, you can stop once. <laughs> yeah, and, right. you know, sometimes things could go, you know, really poorly. Um, so that's actually when I hired my first coach, because I realized, you know, when, when I look at coaching, it's about unlocking human performance, understanding our potential, and then looking at the, the barriers that exist, the challenges that exist, and the desired end state, closing the gap and getting rid of or climbing over those obstacles and those challenges. And, uh, I realized that, wow, I am a really crappy swimmer. And well, if you, if you have a, a cyclist or a runner's body uh, mass index, you, you know, you better be moving through the water or otherwise you're diving. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I was lucky enough to, to be associated with team red, white, and blue at the time. And, uh, we had a triathlon camp down in Daytona and uh, one of the swim coaches down there. Um, he's like, Hey man, you, you gotta grow work. some gills. <laughs> yeah. He's like somehow, some way you need to figure out how to get your arms like four inches longer than they are. Otherwise, <laughs> you know what? You just need to keep doing what you're doing and you'll get after it. Mm -hmm. So then I had, you know, I worked one-on-one -on -one with a coach and it was a pretty humbling experience because the first thing they did was, you know, look at your technique underwater. They would film it underwater. Um, and I, I still remember the first thing they said to me, they're like, wow, you've got a lot going on. Um, she's like, where do you want to start? And I'm like, I just need to get better. And <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, and they were absolutely helpful. And uh, when I did my first triathlon, and we were, it was funny, we were actually talking about this at dinner with some friends last night. I was worried that I wasn't going to make the timeline uh, because for, for a half Ironman, it's an hour and 10 minutes to do a 1.2 mile swim. And it was in the bay down in Miami and the weather was, wasn't all that great. And, um, but, you know, I made, I made the time got out of the water, got on the bike and, you know, you finished. And it was, it was a great experience um, because when I was going through all of that, you know, judicial stuff, all of that administrative mm -hmm. stuff, I had a mentor tell me, um, if you don't get myoptically focused on something other than the crap you're going to have to deal with, you know, your, your mindfulness, your focus, your clarity is going to be absolute crap. And There's that nothing the better best. than intense, than intense exercise though, to help you clear your mind. Yeah. Cause it gave me the time and space I needed, Bob, to, to figure out who I was, what mattered to me and what I was going to do about it. Dennis, are you going to write another book? You know, I got asked that question last week too. I, I think the answer is yes. Um, 
what is it going to be? I'm not sure, but I, it's going to be in the personal leadership arena uh, around, you know, effectiveness and efficiency. You know, how can you really positively impact your environment faster and uh, probably incorporate some stoic principles, some resilience ideas, and uh, some leadership development principles, and really packaging it uh, from, we'll call it the effectiveness habit, um, and uh, really allow folks to explore their personal leadership style and how they can really get to that next level faster. Well, I'll be, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me how 30 minutes goes by in the blink of an eye. We've been talking with Dennis Volpe. He is a uh, life uh, performance and transition coach. Uh, he is a U.S. Naval Academy grad and the author of the book Transition on Purpose. Dennis, thank you for being my guest and for stepping into the spotlight. Thanks, Bob. Enjoyed the conversation and super excited that, uh, that I'm connected with you and uh, the veteran crowd uh, ecosystem. Thanks so much. So you've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. We air on Tuesdays and Fridays and bring veterans and military spouses who are making a difference in our community into your living room. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spotlight. Bravo Zulu to you, Dennis, and that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at VeteranCrowdNetwork.com. We'll see you next time.